Hey, do you teach yoga? Have you ever trained to lead yoga classes to be a yoga therapist? Have you ever owned a yoga studio? Maybe even just wondered what it was like for the women and men up there in front of the room on their mats, leading you through endless Surya Namaskars, down dogs, and pranayamas galore? Well, these are their stories and mine. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, a 20-year yoga teacher, 10-year yoga therapist, yoga studio owner, and co-founder of a yoga-focused nonprofit. I've done a lot in the yoga world over the last 20 years, pretty much everything except had a water cooler. You know, a place to share stories, talk about struggles, successes, and find other people who do the same thing that I do. Welcome to Working in Yoga, a podcast and substitute water cooler for yoga folks to connect and build community, to share our unique profession, our challenges, and our journeys with the world. Hey friends, welcome to Working in Yoga. This week I have Stephanie Adams on the podcast talking about a whole lot of important topics regarding teacher training. Now, Stephanie founded the Sustainable Asana Yoga Foundation, and you will hear her reference this at the beginning of our chat. But after she talks about the foundation, we really get into the heart of things regarding YTTs. In this series, which is almost done, my friends, I really wanted to chat with folks from all avenues of yoga teacher training, studio owners, authors, independent trainers, and academic experts. All of these humans have thoughts to discuss in regards to YTTs, and I'm so glad that we got to hear from all of them. Because the thing is this, how we train matters. It matters because our training directly impacts and can change the trajectory of our entire industry. Who teaches, how we teach, and where will set the tone for our industry for decades to come. And one thing all my guests seem to agree on is that some of our system, if not all of it, needs to change. So let's get the perspective of a longtime studio owner and trainer. I love what she says, and I think you will too. But before we get started, will you do me a favor and like or subscribe to the podcast from wherever you're listening? This helps us podcasters so much, and I know we all really appreciate it. And thank you, as usual, to our podcast sponsor, the Midwest Yoga Conference. Go ahead and find everything you need to know about the Iowa Conference on October 26th in Des Moines, Iowa at www.midwestyogaconference.com, and I will see you there. Now, let's get into it with Stephanie Adams. Hey, friends. Welcome to Working in Yoga. Okay, so this week is yet another in my series of yoga teacher training, and I am so excited to have this conversation today today with Stephanie Adams. So Stephanie, will you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, I have been in the yoga world for almost 30 years. Um, I started training teachers about 25 years ago. Um, I opened a studio. We just celebrated our 20th year. Um, I have authored a book called Cancer and Yoga, um, and I created a program called SAFE. And SAFE is a program that teaches, trains teachers how to understand the basics of human movement mechanics. So how do tissues get injured? What is load? How do we progress poses in a way that doesn't teach you more shoulds, but teaches you the why. And um, just really helps support teaching to a diverse population in a way that allows the appropriate intensity for each person's goals, um, language, videos, quizzes, that kind of thing. So that's kind of who I am in the yoga world. I've been um, really blessed to have a great community here in Hood River, Oregon. Um, And yeah, I just, I love teaching. I love the philosophy. The philosophy of yoga has healed a lot of trauma in my life. So yoga has changed my life in such a powerful way that part of the reason I created safe was because I saw so many people, I used to travel and train teachers and I would see people in the airport and they would ask me about my yoga mat and they would say, you know, oh, I tried yoga, but it was too hot. Or I tried yoga, but I hurt my knee. Or, you know, and I'm like, well, saying I tried yoga, like, that's saying like I tried martial arts. There's a lot of different kinds of yoga. 
for different people and different bodies. And so by creating safe, I wanted to be able to have more people be able to sustain an asana practice long enough to really experience the psychological, mental, you know, whole self benefits of yoga. I think a lot of people come to yoga for mobility or fitness, but what they end up finding is life transformation. And um, it just would break my heart to see so many people that just tried one class and hurt their knee or just because a, a teacher didn't understand how to progress a pose for them. That's you've you've said a word that I use a lot when I'm talking about asana and when I'm teaching asana in my studio, and that's sustainability. Um, and I think that's something we're not often talking about. Sometimes I think especially in especially when you're sliding into more of that like power vinyasa world like that's really not designed for sustainability it's designed to like push your body as far as it can go for as long as it can and then you figure out how to do restorative for the rest of the time and like i love this idea that we're going to teach people how to teach movement sustainably do you feel like that belongs in a 200 hour teacher training program or is that something continuing ed things happen for like, like, how does that slide into how we're teaching new teachers how to teach yoga? Right, I absolutely think it does. And I unfortunately think it doesn't get taught very often in Same. 200 hour yes. programs. Yes, It is much simpler than we need to make it meaning that if you understand the basics of human movement mechanics, like progression and load and how tissues get injured, and this is what the SAFE program teaches, you, you can apply those basics to every single posture. If you understand how naturally and energetically the bandhas help to align the body of the kinetic chain. You know, so yoga has given us these tools, subtle, the subtle energy anatomy, the bandhas, um, but also we can merge that with modern science. And I think that what SAFE offers is very comprehensive and ambitious. So a lot of people don't kind of understand it. They think, how can this one program that's so affordable offer all of this? So everyone that takes the program is really, really pleased with it. I haven't had one person that hasn't been really, really pleased with it um, because you learn so much. And um, it's, I, so Yoga Alliance a few years ago, when they enhanced their standards right before COVID hit, they started requiring 20 hours of biomechanics and that in those enhanced standards. What's interesting is that we had already developed this program and we didn't know they were gonna do that and they allow it to be online. So SAFE is something that you can totally integrate into any yoga teacher training program and your students can, uh, your trainees can, graduate not only with RYT if you choose to be Yoga Alliance, but also with SAFE acronym credential so that they are, you know, that's what, when in my teacher training program, that's what we do. And it also really makes it easier for me as a trainer to be able to teach these more um, challenging concepts because they spend some time online. And then when we're together, we go over the principles in a practical way where we can discuss and they can see and ask questions, but they've already gotten a lot of background from the 20 chapters, 60 videos, multiple images in the online program. So I do a hybrid program in my teacher training where most of our time is um, in person, but there is some live online. And then the only online that I do that's not live is the safe program and that's 20 hours of my 200 hour program so let's talk like not necessarily specifically what you're doing but let's talk yoga teacher training in general so we've yes. got 200 hours here 200 hours it's 30 hours in of anatomy 20 of them biomechanics like for the yoga alliance credentials is yeah. it enough is it too much yeah like, do we have a big focus on anatomy when we need to be focusing on other people, other things like what's your opinion, just in general about the overall requirements for teachers? Right. I, I really say five things. And one of them we just discussed that, that really that teachers are graduating from RYT 200, not understanding how to teach to a diverse population. Yep. 
And I have had multiple teachers come to me and say, I did this 200 hour program. I don't know how to teach to anybody but me, like somebody like me. Yeah. And then they take my 200 hour program and learn, you know, they, they take else, more yeah. than one. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think the first thing is that we really need to have trainers who understand this so they can teach, you know, and, um, the second thing I think is, yes, we need to have programs that respect, honor, and revere the traditional heart of yoga. Like, what is yoga? So many people don't even really understand what is yoga. And Patanjali Yoga Sutras teaches us specifically what yoga is. Yoga is the cessation of the modifications of the mind, right? The fluctuations of the mind. So it's presence. Yoga is presence. Um, and so if we're not integrating that sort of deep reverence and mindfulness and presence into our classes, we're not really teaching yoga, we're teaching asana. So of course, teaching the traditional heart of yoga. It doesn't mean we have to understand every esoteric text out there, but are we really understanding how to create a space that allows presence? Because that's what yoga teaches us that it is. Um, I think that bridging the gap between, you know, a lot of people get really intimidated by a lot of what yoga has to offer. So kind of finding that place where you're bridging the gap, but you're still teaching yoga. Um, and then the third thing I would say is, uh, I know that a lot, and I understand why a lot of training programs are moving away from Yoga Alliance. So um, if, if you are going to be taking a training program that is not going to give you that RYT, um, just know that for some people who hire teachers, they want that. Um, some people want a credential and SAFE is a good alternative for that. I mean, it's not an organization that's certifying 200 hour programs, but it's another acronym or credential that you can get. So I would say, is the program that you're looking at, is it, is it RIT? Is it safe? Is there something that you're going to be getting a credential for that is a little more universal than just this studio's program and they're hiring from their population? What if you move, you know, will this program be enough? Can you explain to a new studio owner what was, how you were, so for me, if someone comes to me and wants to teach at my studio, and they don't have an RYT, I want to know some specifics about what was in their training, you know, and, and to make sure that the training was comprehensive enough that I can trust them with my students. This is why I actually, I mean, I don't want to keep pushing safe, but this is one of the other reasons I have safe is so that I can hire from different training programs and still have everybody at my studio yeah. for an affordable, easy way to get safe certified. So there's some consistency in terms of our Standard, awesome yeah. safety. Yeah. And then the fourth thing I think that's important is that, and this might be controversial, but I think you should be as a trainer teaching your own material. Ooh, say a more. Lot, a lot of studios are purchasing manuals. Um, and I just know for me personally, if I'm teaching someone else's material, it is a little more canned. I yeah. took a lot of time to write my manuals. Um, but I don't need to look at them when I teach. I you know, barely need to look at them when I teach because because they're information that I know. When I st first came to the yoga world, there were only a few places you could get trained. You could yeah. not get trained at every studio. Yeah. And now you can get trained at any studio and um, or almost any studio. I'm trying so I to think like... if I agree with you on that because I feel like I, okay, so I want to talk about this point a little bit before you move on. Like, okay, yeah. because, okay, part of why I'm doing this series is because, like, I have a love hate relationship with training, partially because it's a lot of work for us as the trainers. And I'm a yoga therapist to make a whole lot of more money as a yoga therapist than I do as a trainer, which is, I think, a myth. People think us trainers make a ton of money. This is not. No, it's not a cash cow. Oh my God, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I would probably rather eat glass than teach somebody else's content. Like, I can't imagine teaching someone else's manual 
but I've never put that together. But of course, if you're training and you're a skillful trainer, you should be training your own content. All right, Stephanie, I'm in with you. I agree. I know. And I, I think it's, it's challenging because there's a lot of sort of, um, you know, what if you're somebody who just that kind of organization is hard for you, but you have a lot right. of wisdom to share. So I, I'm, I'm not saying that you can't be a good trainer and teach from someone else's manuals, but um, but then I mean, you're really hard. Star. Then you're a special guest star. Then you're not the trainer because the trainer right. should be the person who's organized enough right. to like do the thing, right? Like, yeah, right, right, yeah. And it's just, I think it's a little too easy now for people to start a teacher training program when they just purchase somebody else's manuals and and we have we're flooded. And the way this kind of is going to bring me to my fifth point is that yeah. I do not agree with Yoga Alliance's change in how they are allowing um, the continuation of pre-recorded material. Um, Ooh, yeah, let's get into that. Yeah, like I really, you know, I trained in a Western way first, yeah. and then I trained in India. And I learned when I went to India that um, traditionally you did not, the time that you were training was not determined by ahead of time. It was like you, with my, with my trainer, um, uh, Jaya Kumar in Mysore, my first trainer, um, he was like, you don't graduate until I say you do. Like we yeah. spend time together. I know you, I know when you're ready to teach and I will tell you when you can teach kind of thing. Right. So I know that's, not going to work in the western world pretty much right yeah but, yeah but but i guess like when you're doing a program that's completely pre-recorded and you like i i had a, a young woman come to me um at the end of covid whenever that was and said <laughs> to me she had done a completely pre-recorded program and she was supposed to have had some interaction with the trainer, but she never actually did. Like the, she said the whole 200 hours, she never had any live interaction with anyone. And this was a yoga Alliance approved program. And she just did not get, um, you know, how do you assess somebody if you've never even interacted with them? Like I thought yeah. assessment was part of this. And I think it's too easy for these programs to say that there's some interaction or I just want, I just am concerned about that. I think I had somebody um, share with me that her husband just to test this did a um, online program and he just, he just put it on while he was driving to work every day yeah. and he was able to do it in 20 hours, a 200 hour program in 20 hours huh. in his car. Um, I gotta get somebody from one of those programs on this podcast. Like I've got to get like whoever runs my vinyasa practice or like I, that's yeah. the one I know in my head, but I know there's tons like, because I feel two ways about it. Like one, I feel like you're correct. Like that's insane. You're not training anybody to do anything when it's, especially a job like ours, when it's all pre-recorded content and you're not interacting with anybody, like how could you possibly guarantee that you're turning out a yoga teacher that could do a thing right yeah but also we don't make a lot of money <laughs> so there's like this disparity between the amount of money you pay for a training and the amount of money you're potentially making as a teacher so to oh, some sure. degree i love that an online program or a hybrid program can make it more financially accessible like yeah. that to me i'm pro but ultimately, I feel like if we all want to make more money, we have to level up our training so that we can level up the industry, right? Like, Right. And I think what's like, when I first heard this, I contacted Yoga Alliance. And I was like, what are you doing? And they said, well, they said exactly what you said. This is an equity thing. Like, we want to be able to make yoga teacher training more affordable and more accessible for people who can't you know, fly somewhere for a month or, you know, be available every weekend once a, once a month for a year. Like some people can't afford to do that. And so I, you know, I immediately got, yeah, yeah, you're right. But this is so far away from the way that the tradition of yoga was taught. And I think that 
one of the things is that anybody who's taken a good 200 hour program in person, the transformative yeah. effect yes, yes. on your life, the bonds you make with the people, the spiritual psychological transformational effects are so profound that so many people that do these teacher trainings, they are like, they always will say this was life changing for me. And I haven't heard that from people who are doing online only programs. It's I just, mean, you're not, you don't have the limbic connection yeah. with people. Yeah. You don't have the feedback from a trainer who really understands you. You're not addressing your individual life questions in terms of the yeah. yoga philosophy. You're not addressing your individual needs as a practitioner because that's part of it. It's not just learning how to teach. It's learning how to practice and be a yogi yourself. Like a lot of people come into yoga teacher training without a lot of that practice. So I don't know if maybe, I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if maybe those who are doing a pre-recorded program somehow have a prerequisite to have had a strong practice or a recommendation from somebody who knows they have a strong practice so that they have a, a teacher that's already their mentor. Yeah. You know, maybe that could be something where you're not just somebody brand new to yoga graduating from high school and you're going to take this online program and you don't have any experience with yoga. Like if it's going to be purely online, I feel like you have to be a very experienced practitioner with a relationship with the teacher. Yeah, and I do know, like, there are some people out there, like Brett Larkin, for example, is a name that pops in my head. Like, she does on online teacher training programs, and they are, but they're synchronous, right? So, like, you're live yeah. with the teacher, and everybody's on Zoom, so you have all the little boxes. And then, of course, you're, like, submitting teacher videos, and her team is watching the videos and giving you feedback about the videos. Like, that, to me, is a different kind of thing than, like, the $99 all asynchronous where you're watching just videos and there's no feedback necessarily from like a team member or whatever like those two things are getting you geared for two very different jobs right but even yeah. before the online i knew people who did like a mail away yoga teacher training course where they were like mailed content and you had to like read the content and do the activities because i mean you know, I've been teaching 20 years. So I'd say like, it was 15 years ago, somebody would come with me with their little log sheet and be like, you have to sign this so I can mail it back. <laughs> like, so it's not like that never existed. Well, that wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been Yoga Alliance approved. Right. Yeah, fair. But, but it, yeah, I mean, you could, there's not a lot of regulations. So there's a lot of programs that that aren't yoga lines approved, right? That, but yeah. back then, before COVID, like you couldn't do anything online. <laughs> but yeah. the new standards were going to say that we could do 20 hours of philosophy and 20 hours of biomechanics, and that was going to be it. And then COVID hit, and they're like, now you can do it all. Um, it's a huge departure, you know, um, within two years and after having to do it all in person for years and years and years. I totally 100% agree with you. I think a program where you have you're online, but you're live with people. Um, you know, and I've done some of that since COVID, been doing hybrid programs and doing, um, but I also going forward, I think I would, I've been pretty lax up to now with, you can watch the recording if, you, if you're not there live, but I, I feel like that's hard to really track um, in some ways. I mean, there are programs that help you do that. Um, so I need to kind of refine that if I'm going to do more of that going forward, just to make sure that everybody is really engaging. And I do that through some, you know, homework activities related to the Zoom, but um, it's a whole different world. And I, yeah. I'm not against online training. I mean, obviously I created an online program that I think yeah. is, that works really well with um, other synchronous learning. Um, so I think there is a place for asynchronous learning, but I just don't think it should be a hundred percent asynchronous. Yeah, I can't, it, you, you brought up a point that actually hasn't been brought up yet in this series that I think you've really nailed. And that is this idea that like the transformative experience that we all have through teacher trainings and almost like 
I feel like where we fail is that the minute you get your 200 hour certificate, that experience is ripped away from you and you have nothing and nobody and we're like, bam, it's gone. Like you can't facilitate that in an online only where it's asynchronous. I do think you can do it if it's synchronous. You can do it if you're like yeah. doing the little groups and stuff like that. And that's part of what makes us feel like there's a little bit of magic in our jobs, I think. Yes. So much. I mean, we, I think that we are human beings that are starved for interpersonal connection and yep. community. We do so much over a screen that, you know, to have, I, that's in my retreats lately, I feel like that's been the, one of the greatest gifts. Like we don't just hang out with people anymore. It's always very purposeful and spending 200 hours with a group of people is, is really yeah. transformative, especially people who are focused on the yogic path. Um, and this is why I have put some attention into retreats too, because even just to spend a week in, in a life pattern interrupt with people who are focused on yoga can be transformative. And so it, it just, makes me sad because well the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is okay when I first took teacher training you had to travel somewhere to get teacher training right it wasn't available everywhere Same. and now it's in you know you can get I live in a small town and there's two or three programs in town right um and so what's happened for those of us who are trying to to run these programs especially in smaller towns like this, is that, you know, I used to get at least 15 to 20 people signing up for my program and now I'm getting like six or seven. Yeah. And it's not really affordable for me to continue. And so what's happening is that a lot of my friends who are really experienced, incredible teachers, you know, authors and just really, they're not doing teacher training anymore. Yeah. They can't afford it. And so we're getting basically people who are just buying manuals and regurgitating the information and teaching to six people because they think it's worth their time to do that. Um, or if you're in a big, if you're in a big city, you can get bigger numbers, right? But it just, it's, these decisions m might be working for some people in terms of equity, but what are we getting in terms of quality? And yeah. are we driving out some of our best trainers and best training programs from the most experienced people? Because yeah. there's just the, the market is flooded with options. Yeah. I, yes, yes, yes. A hundred percent that. I mean, I, I know we already said this, but really to emphasize like this myth idea that we're all like keeping our studios open with teacher training programs and that we're all like, Oh my God, your studio can make no money, but you've made $40,000 teaching. People. Like, no, do you know how much work that is? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I, I think a lot of people who maybe don't have a business mind or haven't run a business, I'm like, I need you to do the math of like, so you've taught 200 hours, but you've probably put 250 to 300 hours into that. Divide that by, you know, how many people you have. like you're making 30 bucks an hour. That's not yeah. a great wage, even if for a yoga teacher. That's not a great wage. And it's a lot of hours. I yeah. mean, it's, a, it's all of you know, your weekend away from your family and you're already owning a yes. business and working full time during the week and teaching. And I, this is the first year I haven't offered a teacher training program. And I just don't know. I just renewed my yoga alliance because I needed to, but I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to continue. Yeah. I mean, I might just offer an advanced training program Yes, because every Tom, Dick and Harry has a 200 hour program. And, you know, I, I can, I love teaching the advanced um, aspects yeah. of, of training, but it's like, I just, I'm not sure. And it's sad because I, I love to do it, but it's the state of where we're at. And I don't know that Yoga Alliance has considered that by offering such, by allowing such cheap asynchronous pre-recorded programs to be out there that the, the, the market is flooded. And so those of us who've been doing this the more traditional way are being priced out. 
I think, okay, so this is something that I've brought up a few times in this series. It just, like, I like to throw it out at people because I do think that owning a studio and running a training program are two different skill sets. Yeah. And that I think that training actually shouldn't be tied to the studios in the way that it is. Like, if you want to train, if that is your passion is training people, I want you to do that. And I want you to do that really, really well. Let that be your only gig, in fact. Like, don't figure out how to pay staff members. Don't figure out how to keep the lights on. Don't figure out what kind of floor cleaner you need. Like, just train people. And then the owners can come in and be like, hey, so I have a business mind. I'm going to talk about marketing. I'm going to talk about all these other things. Like, I don't think they need to be the same the way that they are now. And I'm curious, because you own a studio like me and you train like me. Like, what are your thoughts? People think I'm crazy for saying that. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I think that um, I think the challenge in that is going to be getting enough of the studio owners to be open to, you know, contracting that out with somebody who that's their main gig. Um, And a lot of times, uh, I mean, it's it's interesting, too, because I know studio owners who don't teach, too. And um, I'm, I'm a little less business minded. I'm more community focused and I like, um, I love to teach. So I teach, I own, I I do it all. I wear all the hats, but (laughs) it's exhausting, you know, and, but I love it. Um, I don't make enough, nearly enough money for what I do. Um, so I think it really, I think it, You know, it kind of depends on how you want to do it, too. Um, I think some studio owners, they run teacher training programs because they want to train their teachers in a certain way for their brand. Yes. Um, And I don't, I think teacher training, I like to teach a a teacher training in a way that's more universal so that Mm -hmm. that people could go to any studio and teach. Um, and I, I kind of feel like trying to train people just in one very specific way limits them too, right? So, yeah. but that's, I get why people do it. Um, yeah, like, let's talk about that for a sec, because I also feel like people who aren't owners don't understand that that's what happens, right? So I asked, you and I are in the same sort of studio owners Facebook group. I would say it is like probably the gold standard of Facebook groups as far as yoga goes. Like it is excellent compared to many yeah. others. And last October, I asked like, yay, hey, are you a trainer? Tell me why you train people. And expecting to hear, you know, maybe half of the people saying for money or for whatever. And two thirds of the answers were, I train people because nobody in my area teaches is the way my studio teaches and I thought why do we not have a more generalized training for people so that you could come into a hot vinyasa studio or a yin studio or a restorative studio or a you know general Iyengar hatha studio or whatever and be able to like have 10 hours of on the job training of like hey our studio offers you know seven minutes or more of shavasana and we do it this way and we say these things but that's like like on the job training yeah. and you've had the basics of anatomy and physiology and yoga philosophy and, you know, subtle anatomy. Like you already have, like, why don't we do that? Like, I know. I want that and to I happen. Think, you know, yoga Alliance is attempting to do that. Right. But the reason that people are so upset with yoga Alliance is that one, we pay them a lot of money and yeah. two, it doesn't seem like they are, regulating yeah so we hear about program like i i've heard about programs that are like 10 days Ten days. <laughs> yeah. to program. so yeah. people are going to be training for 20 hours a day you don't you're not no going to retain or integrate that so i think one yoga alliance needs to have a minimum amount of time it needs to be at least a month for 20 yeah. hours like I just think anything less than a month is you don't have time to integrate it into your life you can't retain 20 hours worth of information each day what when do you sleep if it's part of this yoga nidra like what is happening there <laughs> um 
And and so I think that they're losing respect of a lot of people and we're paying them a lot of money. Now, I do think that their standards, what they, what they are, are good. Like it's a good, I think, Based amount of time for different things. And yeah. I think it's good that there is a standard somewhere, but we need to trust that that, that who is registered with Yoga Alliance is actually following those standards. And I know a lot of programs that don't um, when it comes down to the reality of it, you know, um, they just pay their money and Yoga Alliance gets their money and they, they're not really. Yeah. So. So do you think that 200 hours for a baseline is a good, like, I actually think 200 hours for like an entry level job in this industry is fine. Like, yeah, you go I think so too. Like, like, I know a lot of people who want to come and be like, oh my God, it's a 500 hour program, or we should be having some sort of like higher education level program, which I'm a yoga therapist too. Yoga therapy is definitely sliding into a higher, higher education level. They should be because we're integrated yeah. with universities and medical facilities. But like, if you want to go teach yoga at a gym or a general yoga class at a studio, I think 200 hours is fine. Like, I, I totally agree, especially for what we're getting paid, right? Yes. So like, it's an investment. And I think 200 hours, for all the reasons we've been talking about, like, if you truly are, you know, having some synchronous time, either, either live streaming or in person, where you're actually getting a chance to grow as a yoga practitioner, so that you can really, I mean, who wants a yoga teacher who's not a strong yoga practitioner, right? So right. part yes. of that synchronous is helping us become good, you know, not good, but um dedicated dedicated devoted sincere yeah. yoga yes. practitioners and to have some guidance in that way um so i think that yeah 200 hours you definitely can can do enough in 200 hours um but i don't think you can do enough in 200 hours in 10 days i think you need to no. have a minimum of a month my programs are usually 10 months um yeah. but i just think anything less than them and i used to do a month-long program and it it felt like too, like too much too soon. Yeah. Um, but I like now I'm, if people do that, that's fine. But I'm just, I just think that I do think the you know, Alliance needs to have a minimum amount of time. Like, I think that that's part of where they're dropping the ball. Like this person that can do the 20 hours in their car for a 200 hour program. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Like, yeah. no, no, I have a question for you. Um, In your idea of how we're training now 2024 post COVID relatively post COVID right we're all back open we're all you know licking each other's faces. Um, are you training people to teach online in a way because before 2020 it didn't matter if you had the skills to teach online and teaching online is a very different animal than teaching in person you have a whole different like baseline. Are you teaching new teachers that are you talking about that at all. Well, I think one of the biggest differences in um, teaching classes online versus teaching classes in person is one that you're demonstrating on the mat. Because oh. for me, like I used to walk around the room a lot more than I do now. I teach hybrid. So, um, and if I do, sometimes I'll say, okay, today I'll tell my live stream people, today I'm going to be walking around and offering some hands-on assistance if so I'm going to turn and I have to get the people that okay with this that I'm going to turn the screen to the class right because I got to get permission from those people you know mm -hmm. a couple people in the front row that will know the poses I'm talking about but usually I'm on the mat which um, is different so I do have it's funny because over the years I've had some trainees who preferred to teach more off the mat you know and so when it came to zoom time who's on the screen, right? So that's one thing I think that's important. And then of course, all the, just the technical aspects of it. And then also I think creating a sense of connection and community. Like if you're just have a screen there, but you never acknowledge the people on the screen. Yes. Like welcoming them and, and saying goodbye to them and thanking them for being there. Then they could just watch YouTube videos. Why are they connecting with you? You know, if you're not looking at them, if, I mean, sometimes they don't have their cameras on, but if they have their cameras on, I, I want to be like taking some time to also pay attention to the people on the screen. So those are the things I think that are the main differences. Um, and it's interesting because I think about with my teachers, the teachers that do more of that connection, 
they have higher live stream numbers yeah. than, than the people who just kind of have the screen on. Um, yeah, because we have a lot of hybrid classes on our schedule. And so the people that mostly live stream, they have a lot to choose from and they tend to choose the classes where the teachers interact more with them on screen. Yeah. So I think that's a skill too, that we have to learn or that we can train within our training programs. Cause I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but before 2020, I was not teaching online and really mm -hmm. like, like we're all running on vibes in the energy of the room, right? Like I'm a pacer as well. Like I actually don't even lay down a mat when I teach. I'm just like walking and <laughs> and watching people mm -hmm. and figuring out what their bodies are. I, I feel like that's what most of us are doing. We're like, and we're answering the call of the people in the room based on vibes mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that in 2020 was like, oh my God, how I teach now is not relevant in this because now I have to figure out this new skill set. And you're right, like you demonstrate a whole lot more. Your your vocal cues are so much more clear because you have to, you know, they're not in the room to kind of do the side eye. Like you're like, you know, you're like, I need you to do this with this thing and your arms here. Do you yeah. feel so that is that is a new skill? And I love that note of connection too. Like we have to be connecting with people via camera. Yeah, what's the point of um I mean, I think the people, the reason people come to classes is for connection and community. They yeah. could, they could stay home. I mean, and, and just watch a recording if they're, if they're live or if they're in the studio, they are seeking more than just someone telling them what to do. Do you think yoga line should be mentioning that too? Like in our standards, should we be talking about virtual teaching? Um, you know, I think it would be part of the the categories that they already have yeah. so the, those categories being broad allows us to if we're a teacher training program that teaches ashtanga vinyasa you know then yeah. we focus our physical execution part on that if if but i do think that um it is important for programs to consider what you're saying you know to mm -hmm. consider that you know it maybe even have something in the manual about like in your manuals, like I don't have that in my manual. We talk about it, but it, because my manuals were written pre-COVID, I'm like, I probably should add something very specific about that, you know, about what is the difference? Because sometimes I'll have teachers who start and they're like, I don't want to do online. You know, I just want to start in person. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, we have a lot of online options. So, um, and then when they're ready to go online, they're like, okay, well, what's, you know, they do, they want to know what's different. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, do you feel like in your studio space when you're training people, and I'm going to shift topics here just br briefly because we're running out of time and I want to talk about one more thing specifically. I want to talk about what happens after a 200 hour training. So you're training six, seven, eight, 10, 15 people in your studio. They're done. Are you maintaining community for those people afterwards? Are you offering mentorship for them afterwards? Are you like, I know you have your safe program that if they didn't have it in their training or they could revisit that, but like what other things also are you doing to create like professionalism within your teachers? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, I tell my trainees, I say, you know, I'm here for you forever. Like, yeah, and I am like, I, I'm pretty generous with my time that way. Like, because here I used to train for a international yoga training organization. Um, and I actually uh, got them yoga Alliance approved. I wrote their manuals. I, I used to travel a lot and train a lot of teachers internationally and nationally. Um, and um, in 2012, I think, um, I decided to, to create my own teacher training program. And the reason is, is that I wanted to have a more traditional kind of long-term connection with trainees. Hmm. When I'm, you know, traveling to some conference and training 60 people in a level four or whatever, then I, it's like, I just, there, there was connection and I'm still connected to some of those people when I was doing more of the traveling training. But I really wanted to be able to have like a group of like now I had maybe two or 300 people 
that have trained with me in the last 12 years who we have a Facebook group. We, you know, they, some of them have continued on with their 300 and 500 and, or they just come to retreats every year or so and get some CEs or, um, you know, do some of the online, I do a Yama Niyama um, yeah. annual 10 week program, which is just always relevant to your life. So a lot of people will just could take that every year. So, you know, I really teach people that your 200 hours is sort of like your, your skeleton, right? You know, your foundation mm -hmm. and, but um, traditionally you didn't just never have a, you had a relationship with the teacher. Now, yeah. if you're doing an asynchronous program, you're not going to have that relationship. You're not going to have a real reason to stay connected, yes. but even if they, even if, those trainees go off and do somebody else's 300 hour, I'm still going to be there for them in terms of connection. Like, um, I, I just really believe that in, I mean, for me, the reason I'm involved in this, I love movement, but it's the community and the connection piece that has, mm -hmm. that I think is really transformative for people and helps to know that there is somebody you can have a conversation with when you're going through a growth period in your life. And that's, I think, what's going to be sad about the future of yoga teacher training if we go 80% asynchronous. I don't know what the total numbers that they're at, but it's like a really high percentage. Yeah, it is. I agree with you. And I think there that is what differentiates what we do from what happens in a gym. You know, yeah. what happens in your like hit training or your bar training or what like like you're not calling your bar teacher up two years later to be like, I met a guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, have I had that conversation five years? Like, oh my God, Rebecca, you were right. And I met this yeah. person and now I want you to come to our wedding. Like, <laughs> like what we do is different in that way. You're right. Connection community. I feel like we have similar core values. Those are like, those are my core values too. And well, yeah, because yoga yeah. is, is a life practice. It's yeah. not just a mat practice. And so yes. it's not just yeah. exercise at all. Like my teacher says, yoga is not asana at all. And he says that very much to disrupt the Western mentality, but like yoga is so much more than learning how to teach asana. And so, yeah, it just, um, it's concerning for me. And, you know, there was a part of what you said too, about mentoring that I never really addressed. Um, I do offer to people who live in the area that um, we do kind of a community class where they as a group can practice teach and, you know, take donations to a local charity or something like that. Um, I do offer um, and then they send me an email about their experience and then I will attend those classes when I can and give them feedback. So there is an opportunity to continue the relationship in terms of the practical as well, not just the connection community relationship, the life practice. The life practice is definitely always there and that door is always open. But um, in, in terms of the, you know, the practical, that's also one way that we do it. Yeah. Stephanie, will you tell everybody where to find you? Yeah. Um, I have a studio in Hood River, Oregon, which is an incredibly beautiful place. Um, and our website is flowhoodriver.com. And then um, the SAFE program, Sustainable Asana Yoga Foundation, is at safeyoga.com. And that's spelled S-A-Y-F yoga.com, um, not S-A-F-E. Um, yeah, so those are the main places. Thank you so much for having this conversation. I really appreciate both the fact that you hold as many hats as I do, because a lot of people have just one hat or the other. We're suckers. We're doing all the things. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for having this conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation, Stephanie. Here are our key takeaways. First, what do we think about Stephanie's point about trainers needing to teach their own material? She's the first person that I've heard say this outright. And after some thought, I agree with her. If you're invested enough in the act of training other yoga professionals, shouldn't we require that you make your own content? Do you agree or not? 
Let me know. Next, pre-recorded only trainings are a challenge for us in this industry, especially if you take the job seriously. I've now contacted half a dozen online only pre-recorded programs to ask if they would talk to me about how they measure outcomes and the skill sets of their students. And while I came close, nobody would actually pull the trigger and speak with me. Next, spending time together, training is a little bit of magic. And let's just say that now. And sometimes I think we don't appreciate enough what Stephanie calls a life patterned interrupt and what that can do for our nervous system, our brain, and our hearts. We do that, friends. In fact, it might be the best thing that we do when we offer those kinds of experiences to other people. Next, this is another great point Stephanie made, which is an offshoot of what I've been saying this whole series. There is not a ton of money to be had in studios when we train. A lot of our experienced trainers have moved on to other parts of the profession because they're more financially lucrative. And I think this is a shame. We need our best and brightest training the next generation of yoga pros, don't you think? And finally, Teaching online is a new skill that we didn't need to train folks for prior to 2020. We need to have much more discussion, an in-depth discussion, about what the best practices are for yoga teaching online, and I'm looking forward to it in the future. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast, my friends. Next week is my final interview in the series with Leslie Perlman, who runs, honestly, one of the most robust and interesting yoga teacher training programs I have ever seen. Y'all are going to love her. And seriously, bring your notebooks because you're going to want to take notes. Now, let's go get to work, my friends, and I'll catch you around the water cooler next time.